record a lot of videos. <laughs> Quite a few. And one of the reasons I choose to move them around or change my appearance, often wear different hats or different clothes, record in the morning, noon, not usually too much at night, having problems with the camera doing that at night. It's kind of a little uh, orbit sphere. But one of the reasons why I choose to change my appearance and change the way I look at times, you know, shaving or cleaning up or dressing down is because people are directly influenced by appearances. They go by the eye. What they see and what they appear is a lot of their evaluative process of how they judge people or how they take in or put up boundaries or sometimes be at a distance from one another. Jesus shattered that with his disciples by forcing a lot of kind of burly characters with sophisticated people, so to speak, educated people, to get together and be forced to be together. It's like, no, they weren't going to be in one accord because they all agreed. They were going to be in one accord because God said so. <laughs> well, deal with it. But my point being is that we all look at someone and we make snap decisions. We evaluate sometimes those things that we see as similar to us or dissimilar and we either like them or we don't like them. Sometimes with just looking at them. I know for the longest time I used to be frustrated because I was a hippie. Long hair. You know, kind of greasy. <laughs> One of those guys, you know. Um, wore a bandana, you know. Well, bandana. Wore a sarape. Had moccasins, you know. The, you know, big bucks. It's not a little, you know. Pocahontas boots. <laughs> big moccasins, you know. All the way up the knee. Um, leather. It wore out fast. Gosh. You know, uh, onk. You know, Egyptian sign of the dead or whatever life. And, uh, blouse, you know, purple blouse. I mean, it was kind of a colorful combination. But I, I was, you know, kind of just, just a hippie. You know, I was intellectual hippie. I was more like a beatnik hippie than a hippie hippie because I didn't do drugs. But the point is, looking at me, you would have come to one conclusion and you might have been right. The funny thing is, is I went directly from my hippie stage to getting saved. Wow, long hair still. You know, kind of crazy looking guy, you know, and got saved. You know, I didn't wear those clothes the day I got saved. Didn't look quite that crazy. But, uh, got saved. And then I went directly from that long hair and everything else into the Marine Corps. Talk about completely different perspective. And then I looked different. Oh, wow, you know, no hair. <laughs> Go there. And, uh, having grown up most of my life fighting to have my hair because in the town that I grew up in I was the only one with long hair until I hit high school and then everybody grew long hair for some reason maybe they thought it was me <laughs> but they all came over my house and actually dragged me kicking and screaming one time in junior high and snipped my hair nowadays you'd call that bullying in those days the entire town thought it was a service to the community they used to come over and tell my mother that they wanted me to get a haircut Imagine that. That's pretty sad. But it was just one of those small towns in Southern California that, you know, it's kind of conservative, you know, <laughs> even though you don't remember those days per se. But Norco was like that. So anyways, I know people make snap decisions wrongly so sometimes based upon observation. I've gone into a church once or twice, you know, and gone in just kind of, you know, the way I used to go to Calvary, just kind of like sweatshirt maybe and just kind of unshaven or whatever. And you know, people, nobody noticed me. Then I'd go in another time, you know, and I'd put on kind of a, a shirt with a sport coat or, you know, suit or whatever. And all of a sudden, everybody was paying attention to me. Matter of fact, if I put on a suit and tie and I looked shiny, 
man, everybody's like, wow, who's that guy? But if I came in in some other form of clothing or appearance, ooh, who's that guy? I mean, they didn't even bother looking. And a lot of times, we do that in our snap decision ways by what we see as opposed to what God wants us to see. He looks on the heart. We look on the outward things. We see people on the street, and a lot of times we say, hey, you know, that guy's probably making money. You know, I don't know that he really needs the money. God says, so? Give it to him anyways. What difference does it make if you're doing it the right intention? Because you see, if you had contention about it, you would take the person home and, you know, put them up in your house, you know, get them a job and get them cleaned up and get them on their road and get them on the way. That's what God meant in the old way of doing things in society. It wasn't about money, sadly. Because that's the way we get away with things today rather than be personally involved. We send money rather than send the person. And God wants us to be the person who gets involved. He wants us to get our hearts hurt. Really, seriously, that's what it boils down to. Because you see, when you have to deal with a person one-on-one, -on -one, you're going to get your heart hurt. Yeah, if you're a sensitive kind of person, which you should be, God's going to make sure that your heart gets a little tenderized because you've got a hardened heart if you're looking with the eyes that only see the outward things. But you see, God wants you to look on the inward things. And so lots of times I like to change my appearance, my hat, my clothes, my shaving. Sometimes, you know, even a suit and tie, maybe even button the top button, you know, kind of look like one way. And then still be the same person, you know, just teaching away, talking about Jesus, doing the same thing every day. And I often tell people, look, the reason why we do videos the way we do is because what you see is what you get. There's no lights, action camera, you're on stage now, here we go. No, same me. It's the way I am at church. It's the way I am at home. It's the way I am everywhere, as a matter of fact. Because that's what God wants us to be, real. He wants us to be actual and factual, is what I like to say. He wants us to not try to deny what we are, but accept who we are. Because as we start to accept who we are in Him, we'll change the way we look at each other. You know, the way I look at you. Because I can see you right through the camera. Yeah, that's right. I, I'm looking at you. I got my eye on you. <laughs> right. But then again, I may have a word of knowledge and a word of wisdom. God may be telling me all about you. Be careful. He can do it. And you see, that's the beauty of having God as opposed to having man in the way that we do things and the way he does things. Because it's easy to put on religiosity. We all do it. We all put on airs when it comes to that interview. Put your best foot forward. Step up. You don't stand out, you know, when you put on your resume everything you failed at, do you? <laughs> you know, I mean, I one time told a guy, let's see, I, I went to, I've been, I've had a lot of jobs, and to put it bluntly, you know, in my working environment when I was working a lot or going after jobs, because of my disability, I had to get very creative on my resume. The word for creative is lie. Because <laughs> no one would hire me with my resume. And yet, everyone that's ever hired me, for the most part, you know, loved the work output, the workload that you know, I was able to do because I was always working harder to be that witness, to be that testimony, but also because of my own insecurities, really. So, one of the things people do when they change their appearance or they put on these religiosity airs, they're hiding something. It's not that they're directly lying because they're trying to be somebody. It's because they're hiding that they're nobody, really. Because anybody that's, quite frankly, somebody, can look through anybody that's nobody and see right through the facade. You know, the clothes, you know, it's kind of like, yeah, 
You know, there's a little stain on that corner. Yeah, those shoes, you know, they're a little scuffed, you know. Yeah, that tie isn't quite squared away, you know, the way it should be, Marine Corps style, you know, it isn't the right length. You know, the brass isn't so shiny, <laughs> you know, or it's the dress brass that's never gotten dirty because it's never been outside. But when God looks at you, he doesn't see your outward or care about it. It's kind of why we had the tabernacle in the first place. You see, the temple was the religious idea that David had of putting a house together for God. But the heavenly idea that God had was to present a tabernacle of what we are. You see, the tabernacle is what we are. The tabernacle is what we want to be. I mean, the temple is what we want to be. The tabernacle is what we are. The temple is what we want to be. The temple, beautiful outside. Look at all the gold, the tall pillars. It's like, man, the rafters are high. You come into the place, you know, you got to go down to come up to Jerusalem. And then you go up the long staircase, you go in the courtyard, and there's like, look at all the people, man, thousands of people. Then you go inside the portico, you know, and then you begin to look inside. Oh, let's go into Holy of Holies. And it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and darker and darker and darker until you get inside it. Smell the incense? Whoa, we must be getting close to God. You know, all the senses are assaulted by the presence of God. And so that's what the temple was. But the tabernacle was different. The tabernacle had dead thatcher skins. It was kind of like an outward, kind of like temporary dwelling place. You know, it's like it was passing through. You know, it kind of reminded you what you are. You know, it was dead skin, all right. And then on the inside of the dead skin, all of a sudden, you know, you're kind of like outside of the Holy of Holies. There was these places to get cleaned up. You had to get cleaned up. You had to kind of like, hey, there's some food. You know, get some food too. You know, but you had to kind of like, you know, kill the thing in order to get the food. You know, like, ooh, kind of like consequences. Mm. You know, so there's a lot going on, you know, that made sense about who we are in the tabernacle. So, looking at the tabernacle, it wasn't all that pretty. It wasn't something that people would want to come and see what it is, even though it was in the middle of the camp. And it's kind of like, something different about it until you got on the inside it wasn't much but boy once you saw the ark or you were inside the holy place big difference especially with that cloud of smoke and pillar of fire hmm something different about that place but the temple you know the temple a lot of it had to do with the outward things what a magnificent structure man had built for God isn't that a lot like what we do presenting ourselves to God. We like to present ourselves in a favorable light. We like to make our resume with God look so much better than what it is. Well, God, you know, I'm, uh, I don't want to be reminded of that sin that I'm working on, but, you know, I'd just rather worship you. Yeah, let's worship. Time for worship. Time for worship. Let's don't repent any. Oh, repentance is a part of worship. Hmm, that don't sound fun. You mean I got to get real? What if I offended somebody? Do I got to go fix it? You know, no, thank you. Uh -uh, I'm not doing that first. I'm going to worship first so that I'll get ready to fix it or feel like it. You see, that's why we have that facade of appearances as opposed to the reality of who we are. The reality of who we are, if we would just let down our hair, if we would just admit our failings, if we could do, like I said, I've done on a few jobs interviews where I said, you know, if you're going to go by the interview, you're not going to get much. I mean, go by the interview. If you're going to go by the written word, you're not going to get much. But when you see me, when you put me on the job, I said, I'll tell you if I can do it. Matter of fact, within the first day, I will either impress you or depress you and you'll get rid of me. But the point is, I will impress you. And it won't be just the first day. Because almost every job I've had, I've been able to work my way from bare minimum upward. And the fact is, every job that I've gotten, most of the jobs I got, within the first couple of weeks, sometimes a month, but mostly within the first couple of weeks, I got promoted. I'd usually try for something smaller, you know, if I didn't know what I was doing, and usually I didn't know what I was doing, I'd just go in and work hard. But I'd see someone who does know what they're doing, and I'd imitate them. That's what the Christian life is all about. I don't know if you realize that, but you know, you see Jesus and you imitate him. You, know, you kind of be like him and you follow his instructions because he's the craftsman not just the journeyman and so I would get into a job you know and I'd go 
and show what I could do. And by golly, first day, they might kind of, uh, next day, boom, it's like an explosion, <laughs> learning curve, instantly, straight up, exponentially. And so, oftentimes, I jumped into different jobs, all different fields and different perspectives, because I liked it, you know. Sometimes I got sick, you know, from disease, but, oh well, you know. The point is, they always got their money's worth, and more. As a matter of fact, they, most of them took great advantage of what I could do and what I did do. And so, in that way, God wants us to, at times, be real, but not be misled about the facade that sometimes we see others putting on. Because we know who we are if we're honest to ourselves, and that's why we should get that relationship with Him straightened out first talking to him and being real about it but then we once we have you know then we can kind of like look at others and go it's okay you know you you let them you let them do their thing you let them come at you with their suit you know and you go yeah I've been there done that uncomfortable isn't it yeah I gotta take this tie off that <laughs> even if the job requires a tie <laughs> but you know there's more to a person than the tie or the suit. There's more to a person than the clothes. There's more to a person than the outward exterior that you see. There's more to the tabernacle than meets the eye. There's more to the temple than the outward building. There's something more to this thing called Christianity than the religiosity and the observances of what we say we want to be as opposed to what we actually are. Because once you start to get into the reality of what we are doing, living now in a extra I was going to say extra I was trying to come up with a word that was beyond exponential I can't come up with one when we exist in the interdimensionality of the reality of heaven and kingdom of heaven on earth as it is all about us and within us and we are in it then you begin to recognize whoa what we see out here is just kind of like, oh, it's only a, a shadow. It's only like kind of like the reflection of what's really going on. And like once you kind of shift your focus and attention into the unseen realm, you kind of go, ooh, that's kind of cool. You know, I, I like that. I'm not so sure about this, but I like that. That's kind of wow, mind blowing, mind expanding, spirit growing. It's like, whoa almost stepping out of the tabernacle into the temple and out of the temple into New Jerusalem. Whoa, you mean there's a third part that's coming besides the tabernacle, the temple? Yeah, New Jerusalem. Ooh, I go to prepare a place for you. Where I am, there you'll be. Because mm. there's no need for light because the sun is there. A man, son of God. And so I know where I'm going. <laughs> but when you experience that, you start going, wow. Life has more meaning than what we see. Life has more purpose than what we know. Life has design beyond this obviously well-constructed facade of what the reality of God is. Because I only see parts of Him in it, but I don't see the fullness thereof until I experience it in living it out day to day, in living out the reality of heaven on earth and God in me and God in you isn't that cool I always thought about it that way he ever liveth to make intercession that don't sound right April showers or you may flowers I guess it is April <laughs> who is he that condemneth who it is Christ that died, who also makes intercession for us. Christ has not entered into the holy place made with bands, which are the figures of the truth, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Thanks, Lord. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous there is one God and of course one mediator 
between God and man, there is only the man, Jesus Christ. Seeing that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Let's be who we say we are. Let us live out what we have become, not what we want to be. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted just as we are. Yet he was without sin, an example for us to live in. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace and help in time of need. Through him we have access by one spirit unto the Father. If it were only about the temple, It'd be wonderful. And the Jews enjoyed it. Because God did say he inhabited it for a while. Until I think, I believe, if Antiochus Epiphanes came in and slaughtered the pig, you know, and then they did a rededication, I don't think that the temple was ever inhabited again by God. Personal opinion, could get a little prophetic here and start talking about how, you know, how many days it was until Jesus came riding into a bowl of an ass, you know, and that he was the actual fulfillment of God's presence in man, and that no longer would there be the presence in the temple, but in man himself, because man would be the temple of the Holy Spirit. But we won't go there. Or talk about, you know, the Maccabeans and, you know, the Herodians, you know, and how that was kind of like, you know, corrupted priesthood. But the point of our realization is that God made intercession by being the possession of what the tabernacle was, God with us, and the temple became God in us, and that the New Jerusalem will be God one with us, at one with God, I should say. And that the reality of knowing this gives us such a great understanding and appreciation of why we don't have to come under, you know, the tabernacle kind of stage where we're kind of like, you know, like, ooh, you know, we need to be wandering around in the wilderness trying to figure out what we're doing. Or, you know, really making a religious effort, you know, at doing and swearing, oh, God, you know, I promise that if I just, you know, if you just help me, I'll keep going. But we can come into a place of enjoying God because he's making intercession. We can come into a place of knowing God because he's making intercession. We can come into a place of letting God because he's taking care of it. He started it. He who began a good work will complete it. He's developing it. I am persuaded that he is able to complete that with which I have committed unto him. And he has accomplished it. <laughs> now I'm going to get lost on one that's going to go, okay, so what did he accomplish? Having laid, having made principalities and powers wasted his enemies, he is seated at the right hand of the Father. Having made an open show of all them, that we might find appropriately, I, I guess we're jumping around in the same book for the same scriptures and kind of going one to the other to the other to back. Having made a show of all the four principalities, powers, forces, all those kind of things that are out there, you know, he has laid them at his feet at, as he's seated at the right hand of the Father until he has made his enemies his footstool. And that God now, as Jesus makes intercession for us, is at work to accomplish all this for his son. He says, hey, you're done. It's okay. I'll take over. So the Father now is saying, Spirit, go. Bingo. Just like Jesus said, he'd send them. So the Spirit is here helping us with our infirmities, helping us with our weakness, helping us with our insecurities, helping us with our appearances, helping us with our internal realization, helping us with our observation of Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father, helping us with our understanding of knowing that it's all been done, and as far as God is concerned, we won. It's over. It is finished. It has been accomplished, even as Jesus promised that it would be. Because when he stood on the cross, actually hung on the cross, 
He died and said, it is finished. And that means accomplished. That means everything that needed to be done was done. Everything that required of anything else to be done was already finished and completed in Jesus himself. We call that the atonement, the at-one-ment. And the at-one-ment means that because of that, we can become at-one with God. So, going from all of that, kind of like playing with the tabernacle or playing with the temple or playing with New Jerusalem, the bottom line is, isn't it nice to know that you have somebody on your side? I mean, your own lawyer, your own advocate, your own son of God in your corner. It's kind of nice to know that when it comes to a posse, you got God. It's kind of nice to know that when it comes to having a hood, <laughs> your covering is God. <laughs> Work that one out. When it comes to having a fellowship of the reality of not having to be led by the things that you see, but rather the things of the Spirit and led by the Spirit of God, he said, Jesus, that when the Spirit of God comes, He would lead you into all truth, but He would not speak of Himself, but He would speak of me. So you see, it all points back to one thing. Even as in the midst and the center of the tabernacle, there's one thing. In the midst and the center of the temple, there's one thing. And in the midst and the center of New Jerusalem, there's one thing. And in the midst of your life, there better be one thing. And that's Jesus. Because that's the definition of eternal life. To know the Father and to know Him who sent me. That's the reality of all of life. As we exist, as we live, as we move, as we breathe, and as we have our being. For in Him we move and live and have our being. And that is Jesus.